Hey there, fellow entrepreneurs. If you're tired of complicated domain management, I've got the solution for you, Hover.com. Hover makes registering and managing domains a breeze. Their clean interface and hassle-free experience will save you time and frustration. No upsells, no hidden fees, just straightforward domain services. Plus, Hover offers top-notch customer support. Make your life easier. Head over to krmpods.com slash hover. Simplify your jo- domain journey with Hover. You're listening to Fox City's Murder and Mayhem, your bi-weekly dose of true crime history in a small rural community of Wisconsin. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Fox City's Murder and Mayhem. I'm Eric. I'm Gavin. And Gavin, we're back and it's I yes. think we got some pretty exciting revisiting our Wayne Pratt episode. Yes. Is that what we're doing? Yes, today? we're we're still on the on on Wayne Pratt. Oh, uh, I got. I mean, I don't know. Still, but we did the uh, the rerun, and now we're moving it forward. And well, and who out there would expect that one of these mysteries or murders that we talk about that happened fifty years ago would actually get solved? I think this is probably going to be one of the few times that yeah. this happens. So. I hope. I hope it happens again. But yeah, this is a uh, unexpected for sure. So, uh, yeah, so this time we're going to talk about uh, a man named Terry Casperson. Okay. Does that sound cool? That sounds cool. Is Terry Casperson our guy, or is this just another element of the story? Well, you're just going to have to wait and see. (laughs) All right. Yeah. Way to build the suspense. Yeah. uh, Terry Lloyd Casperson is a, he's an interesting character. He was uh, born in Minnesota, probably in Duluth or somewhere in that area. Uh, His family seems to have moved back and forth between Duluth and uh, Wausau, Wisconsin. Uh, He was familiar with both areas. Okay. We don't care about his childhood. In early 1963, and to remind people, 63 is the year that Wayne Pratt is killed. Okay. Okay. In early 1963, Casperson was in the Winnebago State Hospital, which uh, I usually just refer to as the Oshkosh Asylum. Okay. Uh, He was there to undergo mental health testing after a suicide attempt. He was released after 10 weeks. So that's that's some pretty serious testing, I think. While he was out in June 1963, he was arrested for stealing a truck and put on three years probation later that year. We will return to this later in our story. Okay. This is important, but not quite yet. Gotcha. Fast forward to 1964. The stabbing of 18-year-old Eleanor Katz occurred May 11th, 1964 on Barker Stewart Island in Wausau. Not really familiar with Wausau, so I don't know what Barker Stewart Island is, but... Wausau people, I'm sure now. Casperson at the time was 21. Katz was stabbed nearly 50 times. Wow. While on her way to her afternoon classes. She was initially found alive near the Wisconsin River. Um, Her dress ripped and soaked in blood. Six of the stab wounds punctured her liver, doctors said. Casperson was captured after a chase a day after the attack. Katz was able to identify him from a collection of photos the police showed her. Why the police had a photo of Casperson in their collection, I don't know, but uh, they did. He was held for attempted murder on $25,000 bond, but the preliminary hearing uh, set for later. Casperson confessed, saying he was considering suicide, but then saw Katz and changed his mind, deciding he would rather kill somebody than himself. (laughs) You know. All right. What? Well, yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the district attorney told reporters that Casperson signed a statement admitting the attack and said that he didn't know why he did it. It was just the thing to do. <laughs> the thing to do. Crook said that he described the attack in detail, telling prosecutors that he seized the girl, dragged her into the brush, and then thought that Katz had recognized him. Um, Which, then, that is why he started to stab her, because he didn't want to be recognized. 
Casperson also admitted to setting hundreds of fires while in Duluth, Minnesota. Unexplained fires had terrorized residents on the west side of Duluth over a four-year period. So they're like, well, I guess we know where those fires came from now. <laughs> to this guy, this guy's got quite the resume, I guess. Yeah. Two days after the stabbing, Katz died of her injuries at St. Mary's Hospital in Wassa. Casperson learned of the young woman's death while listening to the radio in his jail cell. The murder made headlines statewide and shocked residents in Wassa, who could not understand why a man would attack and kill a stranger for apparently no reason. <laughs> May 13th, the same day that Katz died, Casperson was visited in his jail cell by Sheriff Lowell and Lieutenant Gunther of Winnebago County. This is the county where Wayne Pratt was killed. Mm -hmm. Also by Sheriff Kelvin Spice and Lieutenant Zolski of Outagami County. Casperson told them that in June 1963... He was on leave from the Oshkosh Asylum and was picked up by his parents in their blue Plymouth station wagon. He said while on leave, he did odd jobs for the Holiday Inn, and that was how he spent his time. His friends at the time were Stephen Nagler and Warren Dorrell, and they could back him up. He said he didn't attend any weddings or birthday parties while on leave. The police explained that the Wayne Pratt murder occurred while he was on leave, and it was interesting that he had been at the Oshkosh Asylum, and that the truck that he later stole while on leave was stolen from Winnebago County. So it times out that he's on leave. Wayne Pratt is killed uh, between Nina and Oshkosh. We say Nina, but it was really like kind of a rural area. So and if I remember correctly... And the listeners probably remember this better because I did not re-listen to the Wayne Pratt episode. Sure. But... Wasn't Wayne Pratt stabbed in astronomically amount of times? Yes, he was. Okay. Yes, he was. So this is not uh, working in Casperson's favor here. It, it times out well, and he apparently has uh, intense stabbing uh, motivation. Doesn't look good. <clears throat> Casperson denied that he had ever been to Pratt's service station and said that he had heard about it, when he returned to the asylum, but only because everyone there was talking about it. He offered to take a lie detector test, but he was not given one. Detectives interviewed Erhard Vogel at the Storm Milk Company in Manoa, where he worked. Vogel had stolen the truck with Casperson that last year. He said inside the truck they had a screwdriver and a knife, and Vogel said that he feared Casperson because he would often talk crazy. Gunther asked for an example of what crazy meant, <laughs> and Vogel said that Casperson told him he did not believe in religion and felt that when you died, you were just dead. He said that he had a golden hand, and if he wanted to, all he had to do was touch somebody with his golden hand, and they would die, and they would be dead forever. Casperson told Vogel that he was a genius and did not like to eat animals, because they were just as intelligent as people were. After being arrested, Vogel was again afraid of Casperson because he kept saying he would kill himself and take somebody else with him. And Vogel didn't want to be that somebody else. Two months later, Vogel's interviewed again, this time by Officer Wilbur Fuller at the state hospital. Vogel was not in the hospital when they, he was interviewed the first time. Now he's back in Oshkosh uh, a second time. So he's interviewed in the hospital. He went into more detail this time, saying that he was playing baseball with Casperson, John Olson, and a man named Casey at the Oshkosh Asylum on June 26, 1963, when they decided to just walk away. They walked down a road until they found a farm with a truck outside. The keys were in the truck, so Casperson started it up, and Vogel joined him. The others did not go. They had considered hitchhiking to Kansas, but now Casperson wanted to go to Minnesota. They got gas in Menasha, and they took Highway 10 west to Alma, which is on the state border between Wisconsin and Minnesota. I had no idea where Alma was. They then lit the truck on fire and pushed it down a hill. The pair hitchhiked to Red Wing, Minnesota, and turned themselves in because they were bored and sick of walking. <laughs> 
Vogel told the detective that he was happy to clear his conscience and hoped that he could someday pay for the truck that they stole. After being charged with Katz's murder, Casperson initially pleaded insanity. Casperson was ruled competent to stand trial. He was defended by Norman Bagan. I don't know if that's correct, but Bagan, Bagoon. Um, a court-appointed attorney. At trial in September, Dr. George Andrews testified that Casperson was a sociopathic personality with schizophrenic tendencies. But despite being a sociopathic personality with schizophrenic tendencies, he still understood right from wrong and therefore should be responsible for whatever came to him at trial. The case was pretty open and shut considering that he had confessed, and the jury was out for about an hour and found him guilty. Casperson broke into tears. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. At his sentencing, Katz's own parents said they felt sorry for him and his family. The defense attorney requested Casperson's file be sent to Wapan so they were aware of his mental health issues and could transfer him to the Central State Hospital if necessary. The judge agreed. All right, there's a, there's a bit more here, but if you had anything at this time, you... Not, not really. So, I'm assuming this is the guy that did it. Okay. But, so, but he's, so did he spend most of his life in prison for this? Uh, or, he, I mean, he's he's just been sentenced to life in prison for murdering the 18-year-old girl. Okay. And, <clears throat> but, but he was out on break, so he could have killed Wayne Pratt because he was out from... The asylum. This would be the timing before. does seem correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. And also the way he killed the girl, as opposed to the way Wayne Pratt died. Yeah. Seems to directly point to him. Yeah. It seems consistent with uh, what he would do. Yes. But I'm I'm questioning this because Gavin likes to throw little sliders into things <laughs> yeah. here, and it doesn't seem like this is there. Seems like there's going to be more to this than that. So. So, what is the more? <clears throat> All right. So, he is sent to life in prison in 1964. In April 1977, despite being a, a convicted murderer, he was downgraded to a prison camp, basically a farm, uh, in Lake Tomahawk, which is uh, in Oneida County. And he just decided to walk away from the prison farm <laughs> in April 1977. Uh, he was caught four days later in Trempolo County, which is hundreds of miles, miles away. away. <laughs> so uh, what it, where he was doing for those four days, I don't know, but he got some distance. So for everybody that doesn't know, Trempolo is in the lacrosse area. Yeah. And Tomahawk is, what, north of... It's kind of by Rhinelander. It's like north-central Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So yeah. nowhere near each other. No, not at all. Um, he would go on to serve, after he was recaught, he would go on to serve a total of 17 years before he was paroled in September 1981. Okay. Grand total of 17 years... For killing an 18-year-old girl very violently and escaping prison. <laughs> Good job, prison system. <laughs> He's out September 81. In December of 81, not long after, he threatened a Rhinelander woman, uh, 23-year-old Marie Lohr, with sexual assault. He kidnapped her from a parking lot in Pelican, which is a, also in Oneida County by Rhinelander, and cut her throat before police arrested him. She survived. Wow. In April 1982, he was sentenced to 57 years in order to register as a sex offender. Since the crime was committed while he was out on parole, this also reinstated his previous uh, life sentence, so his life sentence was back on, <laughs> so on as well. <laughs> That fall, uh, Marie Lohr sued Oneida County, uh, saying the police did not respond fast enough while she was being attacked and struggled. Um, she said she was in the parking lot screaming and fighting for some time while being forced into the car, and the police did not respond in an adequate amount of time. I don't know how that lawsuit turned out. Okay, that would have been interesting to know, because that seems like, like 
how do you really argue that? Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know the details of that, but just like the little bit that the news that I found, I was like, I don't know. I don't think the police purposely responded slowly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like, it's one of those things where it's not saying that it couldn't have happened, but it's really hard to like really definitively say it happened and prove that it happened, you know? Right. So I don't, I do not know. Terry Casperson is back in prison. Uh, when he reaches 80 years old, he dies on May 19th, 2023. So as of this recording, that's a little over a year ago. In 2024, this year, a DNA match identified a suspect in the 1963 murder of Wayne Pratt. Authorities at first declined to name the suspect until family members could be notified, but they told the press that it was somebody who was previously on their radar and somebody who had died a little over a year prior to that <laughs> announcement. Okay. Maybe there isn't going to be a curveball in this one because... <laughs> Nina News, a local newspaper that I enjoy greatly, <laughs> broke this story, and they named Terry Casperson as somebody who would match this description. He had previously been picked up as a suspect, and he had died a little over a year before the announcement. He seemed like the perfect candidate to be the killer, but it wasn't him. No! So, so you told an entire episode story, which is good because it was a good story. Yeah, but it's not the guy. It's not him. <laughs> not him. Well played, Gavin. Yes. <laughs> so, do we get to hear in this episode who it is, or is that coming in the next? Oh, episode? you got away for the next episode. <laughs> God, <laughs> <laughs> got you good. <laughs> got you good. But the next time, it is the real guy. I promise that. So. But okay, so this guy got out. Did he? I'm, I I missed it. Did he? He eventually gets out, right? Well, this he got guy. out for the original stabbing. But after after he went back in after the Rhinelander girl, yes, he was in prison until he died. Correct. Okay. Okay. So at least at least this guy didn't have you know like didn't get to live his entire life as a killer and you know no not ever be punished for it because it sounds like he he did plenty of other stuff to get him in trouble yeah it's it's really weird we've talked about this many many times on this program uh on this podcast about like sentencing and things and how now when you get life life generally means life and how it didn't used to mean that it used, it used to mean you know maybe 20 25 years but even in maybe this more lenient time 17 years for stabbing a girl 50 times and then later running away from prison instead of just serving out your time. Yeah. 17 years seems pretty small. It seems very... That's not even a year per stabbing. Right. <laughs> yeah. You could have at least given them a year per stabbing and then, right. and then tacked on a couple more years for the prison break. So... Um, one of the things you talked about, so he went, he ended up in Tomahawk as a, on Lake Tomahawk in a, what did you call that? It was a. In what? what? The prison. It oh. Was, it was. Uh, what do they call it? Do you know what that is? Is that just like a really minimum security prison? Yeah. And the, how is he able The news to... just referred to it as a prison camp. I, I believe that probably means it's like a minimum security farm is probably what it is. So, and, and do you think, like. I guess I've never heard of anything like this before. Um, is, do you know, like, is this just something where they send prisoners and they work? Yeah. Kind of, or? Yeah, a lot of times that's that's something they'll do is they'll have, I don't know how common it is today, but it, it used to be really common where, like, they literally have a farm and they would work the farm and they'd, you know, they'd plow and they'd milk cows and they'd do all that sort of stuff too, just to like keep them busy. And then they'd, you know, and the probably, prison would do whatever they would yeah, do with They the, would either sell the product they made or yeah. serve it to them, I guess, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a thing. Now I, I, because you asked, like I didn't personally look up and check what this Lake Tomahawk prison situation is. So I may be wrong on that. 
So mm. uh, someone can double check me, but that's what I understand. If it's if it's so minimum security that he can just walk away, it's I'm gotta guessing be, it's a prison farm. Yeah, it's got to be pretty lo- loose, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so what were your response? Because I mean, everything fits. Yes. For this guy to be the killer. And then he's not is crazy. Yeah. So so what happened here is I get the Nina News, the Nina newspaper, and they had identified this guy, Terry Casperson, and they were just going off of, you know, a guess more than anything. Mm-hmm. But a really good guess. Yeah. A really good guess. And so I was like, okay. So I kind of looked into it because it was another week or so before the full announcement came out. So I look into it and I'm like, wow, this guy really does seem like the guy. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was limit. I couldn't get as much information as I liked because some of the was on newspapers I couldn't access and things. But I'm like, the timing is right. The stabbing is right. Everything is right. And then I got the Wayne Pratt murder investigation file so i've already posted that online so people are curious they can look at it themselves um i told you it was like 400 pages of of stuff and i didn't read every single page because i'm only focused on the pages that were on our suspects Mm -hmm. but even in there like they didn't cover him a lot like every time he's mentioned we talked about today so it wasn't like they covered him a lot but they definitely saw the similarities as well. Mm-hmm. They just didn't have anything to really connect him. Mm-hmm. Because that was kind of the problem in the 60s. Is you didn't admit to it and you didn't have a witness. That's hard to... It's hard to do. It's crazy when, when you think about that, though. Just goes to show you how hard it is to, to solve these things. Because, I mean, everything... Everything points to him. Yeah. And, and then it's not the right guy. So it, it's just like these people that are investigating these types of murders have a hard job. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I think if that would have gone to trial, and it shouldn't have, there there wasn't enough concrete evidence. But if it would have gone to trial, I think it's possible he'd be convicted. Yeah, I do too. Because, I mean, there is nothing you outlined in there that would suggest he didn't do it. Right. You know, everything you talked about seems like it points directly like this has got to be the yeah. guy. Yeah, other than him saying, I, well, I never went to that service station. That's, of course, that's what you would say. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, can you leave us with a little, like, where are we going from here? Like, can you give us a little snippet of... Who the person could be. We're going to talk about who it really was next time. And it is somebody who I don't think anybody suspected. The police was were aware of him. Like, he's in their files. But he didn't really make the news at all. Um, he's not really directly connected to Wayne Pratt. Like, okay, it's so not, it's not personal or anything. It's even. not. They knew each other, but it was very loose. Okay. So um, definitely somebody that I don't think you could have guessed. Uh, as we'll see, like, when you know he's the guy and you have the police reports, it kind of seems like after the fact, you're like, well, yeah, I guess that was the guy. But it's... You've got to keep in mind, they were looking into a dozen different suspects, and they all had some degree of being possible. So. Right, and they, I mean, if any of them were like this guy we just talked about, yeah. I mean, this would be the hardest investigation ever. <laughs> because Right. So, so but but it, he's not, when you heard the story of him, it makes as much sense that he did it as this guy did it, basically. it There's not like... There's well, some clues that I think really sell it and i'm surprised that they weren't able to wrap it up sooner but again there's so many conflicting suspects that i I don't blame them either interesting so now everybody has to wait for that next episode to yeah to find out except for me because as soon as i hit stop on this podcast we're just going to record that episode that's (laughs) right we'll do it we'll do it right away today so So. everybody else have to wait two weeks of course they can if they just can't wait, they can go to the Google machine and they can find it online. 
Um, but I will say that the things that you're going to hear on this podcast, unless you read the police documents, are not things that made the paper. So this is going to be a much deeper dive than any news story has done. Wow. We're... We're not breaking this story, but we're enhancing this story. We are. I, I love it. We are. We're definitely, there's going to be more to this than than you'll find in any news source out there. So, very cool. All right. Well, do you have anything else for this episode? Or? No, not really. I just wanted to uh, toss out the most likely suspect and then shoot him down. down. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was beautiful. Yeah. So, all right. With that, we'll wrap this episode up and we will conclude this story in our next episode. Yes. And we want to, again, thank everybody for their continued support of this podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Fox City's Murder and Mayhem. Join us in two weeks for another exciting episode of Murder and Mayhem.